Okay. Hi, everybody online. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're going to be talking about fisheries through the seasons. My name is Monique Coons. I'm the director of community programs for the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. Can everybody hear me okay? Everybody good? Okay. So I'm the director of community programs for the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. I'm also uh, a resident of Farswell. I live on Oars Island. And I'm a fishing family. My husband's a commercial fisherman and both of my children, my daughter is 16, my son is 12. They both have their student licenses. My daughter with certainty wants to be a lobsterman. My son is still uh, deciding between lobstering and like a professional athlete or something. So <laughs> see how it goes. <laughs> I'm sure he might change his mind at some point, but... Um, so the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, perhaps you've seen our building. It's the, the blue one that's on Pleasant Street in Brunswick across sort of from modern pest services. We haven't even been there for a year, I don't believe. Prior to that, we were in Fort Andros. Prior to that, we were in a little weird office space across from Maine, Rapid and Pines. Prior to that, we were in home offices and before that, we were actually born out of the Island Institute that's up in Rockland. Um, the organization was first called the Mid-Coast Fishermen's Association, founded in 2006 by groundfish fishermen out of Port Clyde. So when I say groundfish, I'm talking about species like cod, haddock, hake, flounders, halibut, cusk, other things like that, things that are caught traditionally by a drag. Drag nets and gill nets. So the groundfish fishermen founded the organization because they felt like they wanted more of a voice at the federal policy level for smaller fishing businesses. Over the years, obviously, not only did we grow in building size, but our organization has grown. It went from Mid Coast Fishermen's Association with fishermen out of Port Clyde to where we are now, Main Coast Fishermen's Association working with fishermen in basically all of the fisheries, but one or two. We work uh, all along the coast of Maine, and we also work with some fishermen out of Massachusetts and New Hampshire. So another word that I just want to clarify, when I say fisheries, I'm talking about similar to what a farmer might say with food systems, right? So if we say scallop fishery, we're talking about catching the scallop, the supply chain until you get it to your plate. Same thing with ground fish, lobster. It's sort of the whole system that encompasses getting that species from boat to plate. Does that make sense? Okay. If you have any questions about any of the words we say or the acronyms or our terminology, sometimes when we're talking about fisheries, we get going on explaining it and we don't necessarily clarify. So feel free to ask questions um, at any point. So the mission of the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association is to restore the fisheries in the Gulf of Maine and sustain Maine's fishing communities for future generations. I like to think that my part of the job is sustaining Maine's fishing communities for the future generations, whereas some of my colleagues work more in policy and on stuff that happens in the Gulf of Maine. So my job is on issues pertaining to the work and waterfront seafood, and then most recently, fishermen wellness. So mental health programs and resources dedicated to commercial fishermen. So we're here tonight to talk about fisheries through the seasons, spring, summer, winter, fall, you know the seasons, <laughs> and how fisheries through the seasons have changed, what the activities that happen, what you're seeing on the water, how they've changed um, through the years because of environmental factors, as well as things like regulations. Because sometimes for fishing and harvesting seafood, the season isn't necessarily based specifically on fall, spring, winter, or fall, but a, a date that is specifically set by the National Marine Fisheries Service. So we can get into some of that, but I'm gonna let these guys introduce themselves. Tom, thank you for being here. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Tom Santaguida. I live in Brunswick, and I, I'm a full-time lobster fisherman out of uh, Allen Seafood right down the road here at Lookout Point, and I fished out of that wharf now. This is my uh, 23rd year fishing out of that wharf, and uh, my fishing started um, 50 years ago. When I was 10, I started with my stepfather and on his fishing boat. 
by the time I was a sophomore in high school, I had my own 38-foot lobster boat. And then I grew up in New Jersey along Barnegat Bay and uh, participated in a lot of bay fisheries down there and moved to Maine in 1981 when I got my first lobster license for $35, which is now $1,288. <laughs> and uh, I have a lot of uh, variety of fishing experience um, from the regional areas I've covered have been from the Grand Bank of Newfoundland to the Caribbean. I've been to the Grand Banks over 40 times and uh, uh, fish for blue crabs with dredges and Barnica Bay, oyster and quahog tonging down there, um, gill netting and dragging for mid-Atlantic species. Uh, the fishing up on the Grand Banks was fish dragging for codfish, halibut, yellowtail flounders, um, long lining for tuna and swordfish, inshore and offshore lobster fishing, shrimp dragging, and um, now I I call myself an inshore lobster fisherman, which is a very seasonal kind of um, job. And I fish, like I said, out of, out of lookout point. Can you explain inshore? Inshore, so that's not a, a definitive term, but so there's, what I call nearshore or inshore lobster fishing, which is around here. And if, if you go to different places up and down the coast of the United States, that's going to be a phrase that's going to be used differently. But inshore or nearshore lobstering, I would consider to be um, from the heads of the bays out to the, what's called the federal line or the EEZ, the, the exclusive economic zone line, the, the federal line. It's the exclusive economic zone is the 200 mile line. And then there's the, the state line, 12 mile line. State and federal waters are separated by that. And here it's a little further out than other places in Maine. And so we go a little inshore boats, go a little further out without a federal permit, which would allow you to go from the three mile line up to 200 miles. Um, so that three mile line usually follows the contour of the coast, but there's two places in Maine where it doesn't here and it's in the Stonington area and it jumps from headland to headland. So here the, the line goes from Cape Elizabeth to small point Phippsburg. So all of Casco Bay is inside the state line, but it's pretty far out. It's like 12 miles out. It's a little further. So boats that fish inside that state line, I would consider to be inshore boats. And then, then there's offshore boats that go beyond that. And um, that, there's a lot of offshore lobster boats in Maine, especially in the last 25 years. There's a shift in where fisheries are happening. And then there's what I, I consider to be offshore lobstering, which is George's Bank, Hudson Canyon, in, at outer shelf, um, you know, 100 fathoms or deeper water. And those are large vessels. 80 to 120 feet steel vessel. So that's what intro lock is. Thanks, Tom. Yep. Hello, everyone. I'm John Harrigal, and I guess um, I'm here representing the uh, New Meadows River Shellfish Co-op, and one of our members, Dana Morris, always says, wearing different hats. So I'm wearing that hat as an oyster farmer, but um, also hearing the word fishery. I also started the main oyster company, and I guess you would call that kind of an oyster fishery, kind of started from a farm and then turned into doing events and then turned into an oyster bar and then turned into kind of distribution, direct to consumer and direct to partner. And now it's kind of grown into some other endeavors around that. So I guess present somewhat of a unique perspective, kind of knowing the whole vertical supply chain now, a little bit from the farmer to the, um, to the consumer. But uh, I'm also, I'm from New Jersey, from Northern New Jersey, and then grew up um, coming up here in the summers and kind of stumbled into this whole industry of aquaculture. I always call it farmer versus fisherman. And it's been a really unique journey. I mean, starting my farm in 2016. So I'm very fresh on everything. And our New Meadows uh, River Shellfish Call has been really exciting. There's 12 of us farmers in and we're all kind of really kind of figured out as we go. So I think it's, that's one of the best parts about our co-op is we're all just individuals with a real, I think the common denominator I found with all aquaculturists seems to be at least oyster farmers is a real like passion for Maine, a passion for the environment and a passion for just um, being on the water. 
So um, it's been a fun journey thus far, but I'm looking forward to hopefully explaining anything about oyster farming, the oyster supply chain, and figuring ways to continue to work together on all different fronts. And I'm, I'm not from this peninsula. I'm actually from over Pittsburgh now, so across the way, so in West Point specifically. So I live with a lodgeman on both sides of me and I've gone live stream once, and uh, it's, been, it's been fun to learn all the different types of fisheries thus far. We were going to have a clam harvester with us tonight, but he couldn't make it. But if you have questions about the intertidal area, um, I'm sure we can answer them as well. So let's start with springtime. Do you want to get going and tell us what do you do in the spring, Tom? Okay, so my season, if you'll call it that, starts, if we're going to start with spring, my boat will get launched in early March usually. And... At that time, where I fish, the lobsters are not really going good yet. But there's pretty good crab fishing in the bay. And I'll set crab traps, which are very popular in March and April because they're shedder crabs. And these are limber leg or peachy toe crabs, the bay crabs that we, we catch around here. And there's a nice little local demand for them. So that kind of keeps me busy while I'm getting my lobster gear ready. And then around the end of March and April, I'll set lobster traps on what's called the cod ledges beyond out in the open sea and some lobster traps in the bay around the rocky edges and ledges around the islands. And that's, it's not, it's not a real abundant time for lobsters, but the price is usually a little bit higher in the spring. And spring fishing is important seasonally because as the lobsters move in from the open sea into the bays, you can actually watch where, how they're coming in and where they settle to shed. So that spring fishing to me is, is homework as much as it is a little bit of springtime income. So the lobsters are coming from the sea and they go to different places every year and kind of plop themselves down in groups, hopefully. And if you can learn that in the spring, you have an advantage later on during the shedder lobster season. Yes, sir. Do you learn that simply by where you're catching them? Yes, you yeah. I call them, I call them scouting. I, I I'll set traps kind of everywhere yeah. in the spring. And as I they may come through this channel one year and the next year they come through this channel and you kind of try to find where they're going by jumping ahead of them. And most of the lobsters are sublegal as they come in from the sea. So, but when they settle down into an area and then shed, they come out and they're legal. So it's, that's, that's um, my springtime activity is basically getting my lobster gear ready, setting some for spring fishing and crabbing. That'd be my spring fishing. What are you doing in the spring, John? So I guess what am I doing this spring? A lot of different <laughs> things from the, from the farm perspective. I mean, similarly, like to a I guess lobster in the intro lobster, we're kind of getting the farms ready. We're bringing them up, essentially bringing them to life. So with the oyster farming, essentially you, you have a defined coordinate. So you're not, once you kind of pick your spot, you're really not moving, you're not moving from that spot. So it, in the, in the winter, because the new meadows will freeze over, we, we sink all of our stuff. So in the spring, we're kind of bringing these, um, essentially it's a cage. I mean, in, in the new meadows, you really are farming either on a floating cage, which is essentially a lobster trap with two pontoons on it, or a, a bag, which is really just hard plastic mesh with two little mini pontoons on it, or a cage at the bottom. But most people have these floating um, equipment. So in the spring, all this stuff has been on the bottom of the ocean. So you're really like praying that the stuff is still alive and not all mangled when you try to get all this stuff up from the bottom. And it, it really is a farm to farm specific. It, it's kind of amazing after visiting many different farms for the same rough concept, the exact same, it's every farm does it a little different. It really depends on how deep you are. If you're hauling your traps up from 30 feet, where my farm is actually, my farm's actually in small point harbor. So I'm Technically, new meadows, but not kind of mouth in the meadows, but I'm only in four feet of water at low tide. So I'll go out in a wetsuit physically at the spring tide, the negative through tide, and be able to kind of manhandle these cages. Because if you can visualize the cages 
like this. Each one has six bags in it. Each bag weighs, let's say, 40 pounds, say 40, 80, 240, plus two pontoons full of water. And it's cold, and you're just trying to get this up, empty the pontoons, and then that's like that's the goal. So it's really just kind of getting the farm up, and then would be the first part of the spring, and then you're just kind of systematically going through all the different cages. Like for a scale, every farm on the New Meadows is pretty small in scale. I always give the scale concept of I have 30 of these floating cages on essentially six 1,200 square feet of lease space from the state of Maine. Mook Sea Farm up on the Damerskata. Don't quote me on it, but they have thousands and thousands of cages. So the scale of our farms on New Meadows and most farms on New Meadows are probably in the 30 to 60 to maybe some of the large ones have 70 of these cages. But most farms are on the measure of these boutique farms. It's an individual who's kind of doing it as a secondary income stream and usually has something else going on. And so they're, they're smaller farms. So it's all figured out how to get these cages up, essentially, and get them floating for the season. So one thing that my husband does in the spring and some, I don't know if you do it. Do you build your own traps? No. No. Mike, fix you fix them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the big yeah. yeah. Every year my husband tries to replace some of the traps because he does go yeah. offshore fishing and they can get kind of beat up. So in the springtime is, I always kind of think of it as like a get ready season. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, I didn't mention that. Yeah, a I, yeah. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of maintenance to happen and stuff. And so you can find him in his trap shop bending wire and clipping heads to the traps. And one thing I find hilarious is that um, I think every lobsterman has their own unique way of sort of building a trap. And so if someone comes in to see Herman, they always tell him like, oh, you're doing it wrong. This is the way that I do it. But guys, other than like the basic design of the trap have their own little unique touches to them. So he spends his time doing that, but you might see people getting traps delivered. You might see a lot of traps on the back of a pickup truck. You might see like stacks of wire being delivered. And those are all tools necessary to, to build traps. Um, in our office at Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, um, because we do work with ground fish fishermen, they're also, they, you can go ground fishing year round, but there's a, most ground fish fishermen in the state of Maine also go lobstering. And so they're also getting ready for, you know, what they've been doing with ground fishing, what they're going to keep doing ground fishing, and then also getting ready for lobstering in the same way that Tom is. One of the things that used to take place that's not as dramatic is fishermen used to have something called an annual round, which is when they would build traps in the springtime, go lobstering in the summer and fall, and then do something like shrimping in the winter or maybe they were a caretaker on the islands, you know, taking care of summer homes or people aren't there anymore. That's not as common as it used to be because of the increase of regulations and the increasing cost of doing business. So that's why there's quite a lot of lobstermen in the state, not as many uh, ground fish fishermen um, as there used to be. And we can talk about that a little bit more, but let's get into summertime because especially around here, um, and especially over the past few years, we've, I'm sure you guys have started to see different kinds of boats um, in the inshore, like uh, menhaden boats, pokey fishing. And I can talk about that in a second, but Tom, why don't you tell us, what are you doing in the summertime? So <clears throat> once spring fishing's over um, and it's getting to be late May, June, um, my traps go in the water as fast as I can get them in because I've decided where I'm going to set them and it takes a lot of effort to get all the traps in the water. And at my wharf, there's 10 other fishermen and we're all juggling for wharf space. I, I like to even go down the middle of the night on high tide to load the boat to just avoid the crowd. So it's a very busy time of the year. And <clears throat> I also, um, so in June, the traps go out and then we, get onto a, a regular hauling schedule. And I like to go every day of the week. A lot of fishermen will haul their 800 traps, they'll haul 400 on Monday, 400 on Tuesday, take Wednesday off, not Wednesday off, but they won't go hauling on Wednesday. Thursday, haul, Friday, haul, skip Saturday, Sunday. And that rotation is a very common rotation. I don't uh, do that. I, I do like, 300, 300, 200, 300, 300, 200. I like being on the water every day. I, I feel I miss things if I'm not. So 
So summertime is just this intense, get up really early, stagger through the door, make your lunch, repeat over and over and over again. And then if I do have a day when I'm not hauling, I'll uh, gill net for big fish for myself. Um, you're allowed, if you have, if you have a non-commercial pogey like Menhaden pogey license, which is the bait that we use a lot of, you're allowed to get three barrels a day on this non-commercial license. You can't sell them though. You have to use them for yourself. And um, I'll, I'll do that or I'll go crabbing. I set crab pots as well as lobster traps and I'll haul those if I'm not on a lobster fishing day or I'll go mackerel gill netting for bait. And so it's just go all the time. And Sundays when you um, just to inform the people who don't know about Sundays from June 1st to September 1st in Maine, you cannot haul lobster or crab traps. Once Labor Day comes, you can do it on Sundays again. So on Sundays, that's a day when I will go to the bait freezer and get some different types of bait for the week over in Freeport or change the oil on my boat or do maintenance that occurred, uh, maintenance issues that occurred during the previous fishing week or any, any number of other errands that need to be done. So it's a, summer's a really busy time uh, for lobster. Yep. Is, that, that is, is it busy for the offshore guys? When do they, do the offshore guys go like you do? Or I, I thought there was like a winter spot. They fish. have a good winter fishery offshore. Yeah. Okay. So. so they go both. So like I said, my husband does have a federal permit and the, he'll go offshore in the winter time. And yeah. he'll, historically he stays, he'll come inshore during the summertime, but because it's somewhat crowded and because the lobsters are moving around, he doesn't necessarily have to come as close to shore as he used to. So some guys that are offshore just fish around here in the summertime. Sometimes they stay offshore and they keep fishing, um, which is what my husband did. He kept a lot of his traps offshore. And then when he was home, he would go pokey fishing, menhaden fishing. So, um, you know, when I was a little kid and I grew up in um, Europe, my father worked for the military. I thought lobsters only existed in the summertime because that's when we ate them. We were just, you know, and I think a lot of people that come to Maine and vacation, because they'll ask me, they'll say, well, what's your husband do in the wintertime? Like, well, he goes lobstering. Well, what's he do when it's raining? Still goes lobstering. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it, it's, 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 um, we're very lucky in Maine because there's so much seafood that's available just sort of year round with ground fish and lobstering. It's just sort of where they're fishing that changes. Um, can I just get like a really quick um, breakdown and sort of life cycle of the lobster so that I understand what you're talking about, about why they're out in the open ocean and then they come into the bays? So like, how does that all work? It's a great question. You want to? Yeah, sure. So that is a good question. And I'm sorry if I'm taking anything for granted because I just know. <laughs> Lobsters, um, I'll start with the winter time. Okay, so there are lobsters in the shallow bays in the winter, but not many, and they typically will just sit there. They don't move around a lot, they don't feed a lot. So you can have traps set and lobsters there and you don't catch any. So, but most of the lobsters in the, in the winter, around November, December, head offshore and they, I've read a lot and studied a lot about how they do this. And I think even lobster science experts probably are befuddled as to the exact way they do it because they scatter all over the place. But they do, generally speaking, lobsters will go out to deeper water in the winter time. And then once the springtime comes around March and April, they'll come in from the outer shelf area, the 50 fathom edge where the water drops off the shelf. And they'll come up into the area that's about five miles offshore. There's hard bottom edges and they'll stop there for a little bit. And then they'll come to the outer islands and stop there for a little bit. And then they swarm into the bays and shallow waters, like the bays you see right around here. And when they come in, in that springtime, they're all hard shell lobsters and they find rock 
holes and rock piles and mud flats and they bury themselves in the mud and hide themselves in the rocks and kind of on a staggered timeline they start shedding around the beginning of July and so they go from these hard shell lobsters to these new shell or shedder lobsters and they grow remarkably in size when they shed and those lobsters start crawling and going into traps and that's when we start getting good volumes of catches in the from uh, late June until around now. And then that cycle repeat. They start leaving the bays and heading offshore again. So that's kind of a general cycle. They but shed one time? I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I think they shed twice sometimes, but I don't know. They look for a little more water or some more feed. What the migration? My great reason. I think it's water temperature. Yeah. yeah. Is the primary reason. So we have a couple questions from online. <coughs> um, one is how you keep track of where every trap is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and do you lose some? That's a good question. Too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to speak nowadays how we keep track of them because. And when I was little, we had a notebook. And we would actually draw the island or the piece of shore, and we put a line there, and that's where the string was. But now, almost every single lobster catcher that I know has a, a chart plotter of some type or more than one chart plotter. And there's some that are made almost exclusively for lobster. Like mine is a Hondex chart plotter. It's got a great big screen, and you make a symbol using a cursor and add on the chart. It's got a chart software on it and you can change the colors on it and the shape of the symbol. And this way, you know that the red ones I set on Monday and they're gonna be hauled on Thursday, the blue ones I set on Tuesday and they're gonna be hauled on Friday and then change the colors. So my, you know, that's how we keep track. And, and each time we haul the, the, the Monday's red ones, I'll erase it. And then when I reset the string, I'll make a new symbol, a new color. Well, I, I could never figure out how you knew you got all 300. Yeah, I and mean, it's, it, it's even, with the, even with that, it's... Even oh, with I missed the water, one. it's impressive. Yeah. When, even with, like if I went out with my daughter yesterday, and it's cute at the beginning of the season when my husband sets traps with them, he still draws like a little map and he's like, don't forget it's over here and yeah. over here. And I went out with her yesterday and I'm, I'm so impressed with her. Cause I'm like looking, I'm like, where's your buoy? Where? And she's like, mom, it's right there. <laughs> and I'm like, I have no idea amongst the buoys. And she's like, that's number 14. That's number wow. 10. And I think once you're out there and you have that passion for it too, but I think it's, it's impressive. Even just you guys getting around with your charts, like, you would think that there was landmarks out there when they're like, oh, you just go left over at this ledge and that, and you're looking out there and it's like, it's just blue. <laughs> you know that. So and you have fog and, and wind and, and everything else it's, on top of it. Yeah. It's impressive. It's a different type of mm. mindset when you're out there. So do you ever lose traps? Tom? Yes. Yeah. And so <laughs> you can speak to this because you rescued my trap. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So you lose, that's right. And I, lo- I lost the trap, crab trap today, but I, Found it on my water, my sounder. Um, <clears throat> so traps are lost in a variety of ways. In the springtime, out, out offshore, if you have traps, what we call up top or up on high bottom, and there's a storm, a springtime storm, you can guarantee that you're going to lose some either to losing them or when you bring them back, they just look like a ball of wire that's all twisted up. And... Sometimes the uh, buoy line will go up tide and then down tide, and it'll go around the trap. And as it keeps going around and around, there's less and less rope, and the buoy will not show anymore. So sometimes it undoes itself, and that is a way that you lose traps. Um, One of the ways you lose traps around Casco Bay is to recreational boaters who will don't understand how to uh, navigate around buoys and we'll chop off the buoys with a propeller and 
and ship traffic out in the open sea, that's a big trap loser. Um, sometimes you can use a chain grapple and drag with hooks, heavy hooks on the bottom to get your gear back. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. And you can also lose your traps to other people who don't like where you've, they, you've set your traps, other lobster catchers. And that's, that's not, ha doesn't happen so much anymore, but there are some people who aren't very friendly and, you know, they, they'll cut your movies off. That doesn't happen that much. So there's a variety of ways. And uh, yeah, Susan had a lobster trap that disappeared on her. And it, for some reason, they just, the buoys will go down sometimes. And, and lo and behold, I was out crabbing one day and I look over, boom, there's one of Susan's buoys. And I said, Susan, I, I think it, it showed up again. Why it went down, we don't know. Why it came up, we don't know. But, so there's kind of a mystery there that happens. I've seen that happen over and over again. So there's a variety of ways you lose traps. I don't lose very many per year. Maybe I maybe lose 10 traps a year, tops. What do trap cost? The traps that I use, brand new. Well, this year I, I'm going to tell you because I don't know. It's a crazy amount of money because of the, the material. <laughs> but in a non supply chain problem year, the traps that I use cost $115 each. So, Tom, you just answered there was a question about um, what what is your opinion of stainless steel lobster traps? They're more costly. Do you think it's worth it? Do they pay for themselves over several seasons? So I don't think, I'm not convinced stainless steel would work for a lobster trap. Here's why the, the lobster traps we use are regular steel covered with a vinyl coating. Mm -hmm. And stainless steel, if, if it was covered with vinyl coating, that might be great. But the cost would be insane. And um, uncoated stainless steel would just oxidize in the sea, even though it's stainless. So I don't, I don't know if that'll ever be a feasible solution to a trap that is going to last longer. Could you say, you know, you said in the spring you put some traps out to see where the mm -hmm. lobster settle. How does that conflict with the territory? How territorial lobster? We hear lobstermen are, you know, we own this no. space, or is it, or is that? No. I, traps I, are everybody, everybody. Yeah, I put out, there's there's very few traps out in the spring. I, I put out about 300 in the spring, 250 to 300, and I scatter them everywhere. But I, I'll fish from um, Webster Rock Reef, yeah. which is basically an under underwater extension of Bailey Island now to Halfway Rock Lighthouse all the way down to Cape Elizabeth. And that covers a lot of different Portland, Freeport, Yarmouth, Parkswell, Fisherman, Shabig Island, the Island. I don't have any trouble. <clears throat> um, Casco Bay is kind of nice that way. There's a lot of spreading out of, of uh, lobster harvesters. Down east, it's a little more territorial and around Cape Portland it is too. But um, so I don't I don't find that conflict too much. I think conflict trouble with other fishermen in this area has more to do with the behavior of certain individual fishermen towards others more than it does about you can't go over this way. You can't go over that way. Thank you. I mean, there's a reasonableness. I, I don't think I go around Phippsburg and set traps. I think <laughs> that would be another way I'd lose traps. But uh, you know, there's a reasonableness. <laughs> Um, that was part of a question from one of the people in the audience as well. How lobstermen decide who gets to put their traps in an area? And you talked somewhat about that, right? Yeah, so that's um, generally speaking, with a cone that would start at your wharf, your home wharf, your home port wharf, and go out. And there's some overlap of those cones. And it's kind of learned common knowledge. If you're from Lookout Point, you're not going to go over to Cundy's Harbor and set a bunch of lobster traps. It's just not right. And so it's not, I don't even know if it's discussed that much. It's just not right. And I'm not going to go over in the Harrisica River either. It's Freeport lobster in there. So it's kind of a 
unspoken. Osmosis. Um, traditional. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So there's no. <laughs> so, but it's okay to set them in the springtime everywhere to. Uh, no, I, no, that's springtime. I mean, when I say scatter around, I mean scatter around the area I fish. I couldn't, I couldn't set longer traps in the springtime in the Harrisseeker River where it kind of was hard. It was just not right. Could you just win that game? I could. <laughs> yeah, I mean, legally, I could. Legally, I could set a trap anywhere from Phippsburg to Cape Elizabeth, which is my zone, zone F. But th there is a reason that it's part of that. I think it's like an etiquette. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it's it. an etiquette. Like there's respect for this is where those fellows fish and this is where these people fish here. I fish here, and there's some overlap, but not too much. It's like the fringes of boundaries of the nest, is it? <laughs> so what are you doing in the, in the summertime? So the summer and oyster farming, I mean, it really depends on, like, how well you did in the spring prepping stuff. So you can either be, like, on top of your game all summer or, like, kind of, like, catch up all summer. But essentially, I call it, honestly, going to war in one way with these um, traps because – Oysters, uh, maybe like lobsters, like warm water. So they don't really they don't metabolize below 40 degrees. And from my kind of four or five years of experience, they really get grown around like 60 degrees. So you have this kind of window of summertime where they're just, it's just, it's kind of mind blowing, honestly. You'll put 5,000 little baby oysters that take up a, a mesh bag is like, let's say that wide and that tall. So a bag can be confusing. Then it's just like a square plastic bag. And we'll put 5,000 oysters. It takes up like that much space in the bag. That goes horizontally into one of these cages. The cage has six of these bags. So in theory, you could have 30,000 little baby oysters in a very small footprint. They just sit there and the water flows over them. And that biomass will go from that to sometimes like that in like six weeks. So but with the warm water comes algae and all sorts of things. So you're constantly out trying to essentially it's like, and again, it depends on the farm. So my farm, if I can get out there once a week, that's, that's awesome. All of us farmers are newer. So every year our farms are growing. So we don't have a lot of baselines, but the rough concept is in the summer, you're out just kind of keeping these bags as clean as possible and the cages as clean as possible and then ultimately harvesting them. So we call them markets. So they start as little babies and every farm is a little different. I call mine babies or new first year, second year, and then market. So if you can visualize, you have 5,000 in a bag that grows here. Another part of this summer maintenance would be that bag you take onto a float, onto a dock, and you dump it out and essentially put 2,500 oysters into two bags. And then you do it again and they go into the bag and they grow again that big. And then you dump that out and you put 1,250 into four bags and then 600 into eight bags. And then kind of a full market oysters, about 300 oysters per bag. So it's kind of mind blowing. So, and what's the time frame? That's like a two to four year process. And the new meadows, they seem to be growing quite quickly. The water is just really warm. It's a very conducive environment to farming like the Dan Riscata, and the nutrient levels are high. Um, so essentially the summer is really this continually having your bags, keeping the bags clean, but then you got to get, it is, it is truly farming. So every year we're buying new seed baby oysters. There's, there's two hatcheries in Maine that essentially produce all the little baby oysters for, for the entire state and a lot of the East coast even. So we'll then come kind of July or just, so if you got your game face on, you're in your maintenance mode, you're not playing catch up from getting anything clean from the spring. You then buy anywhere from 10,000 to half a million little baby oysters. And then you got to stick all those and you kind of reset the process again. So you on a farm, it's, it's well, most farmers in Maine are very new. We've only been around really 10 years, I'd say more than probably two thirds, if not more of the farms. But the first two to four years of your farm, you're really in like pre-revenue, pre-cycle because your ones aren't ready until really year four. So every year we're kind of like figuring it out again because our farms are getting bigger and bigger and you're buying more oysters, you're buying less oysters. So the routine in theory is kind of this harvesting maintenance mode, but it is truly every farm does it a little different. Every farm has different cycles. So it's not quite as routine as like, say, the lobster industry, because every farm is trying the same concepts again, but everyone does it a little differently. And um, I could go a month without going to my farm and that would be really bad. It's really disheartening when you go out to your farm and you haven't been there a long time, you know you're bad, and you grab out a bag, it's just like full to the brim of algae. They can't, there's no water flow, and then they're all like, they, they die, and it's just, it's like very frustrating. But that, that's a summer's kind of that continual maintenance mode. Yeah. 
How do you get your farm? So it's it's through it's, so it's actually you're actually leasing a square footed. So there's three types of farms in Maine. Three types of the quick order of aquaculture. I like to call it silos. There's let's call it the fin fish silo, the seaweed silo, and like the shellfish silo. Then you could segment the shellfish kind of into oyster, scallop, mussel, um, clam, whatever. So all regulated by the Department of Marine Resources, and we're essentially um, applying for a lease. And so in what most farms in New Meadows have are um, LPAs. It's called a limited purpose aquaculture license. So we fill out an application and we're physically saying this 43 North.00, whatever, and this is where our farm's going to be. And we diagram out what it's going to look like. And it's for 400 square feet. So it's a very small footprint. And an individual can have up to four of those. So I have three LPAs, 1,200 square feet. The next stage is an experimental lease, which you get up to four acres, and then a standard lease, which is up to 100 acres. But those numbers are very deceiving because the whole system was trying to encompass everything. So where would you ever need 100 acres? Really just for salmon farming, where you would have potentially your, your cycling fish through it. I think salmon got a bad rap early on in the 80s. They actually have an extremely clean fishery now, the aquaculture side. But from an oyster and a shellfish perspective, I mean, say I have 1,200 square feet. I can probably comfortably grow if I really my gay face on for my farm, 30 to 50,000 oysters a year on 1,200 square feet. I mean, one acre is 40,000 square feet. So you can kind of do the math on how you don't need a lot of space to grow oysters. So most farms on the New Meadows are LPAs. And then there's some, so say if I want to, I could get a standard lease, but I would apply for like one or two acres or 1.5 acres. I was going to get a lease, but I decided with all these other endeavors not to, and I was going to get like a 0.71 acre lease, but it would still be a standard lease or an experimental lease, but it would be just not the max out number. But essentially then you renew it every year and the, um, the Department of Resources and the Army Corps of Engineers are essentially, and they, they really look, it's, it's, they do an amazing job for like a very small group of people. They're regulating a, a lot of different components of it. And, um, and, they, and that's, that's probably the idea. Question? Do you, do, they, do you feed them anything? I mean, the... the, <laughs> the I mean, they, salmon, you feed it. Correct. So that, that's why the shellfish, you can really get fired up about the environmental of seaweed and shellfish yeah. for sure, because they're feeding... They're essentially on the front end, the oysters are just filtering the water. They're taking particles out of the water, kind of taking what they want, growing their shells. So they're kind of cleaning the water as they grow. So there's no net input. They're one of the few things, if not one of the only, that's in the, for every pound of protein you produce from shellfish, you're helping the environment out because they're clean on the front end. Then you can throw the shell back in and with global warming, the acidity of the ocean is, um, is rising. The pH is going down. So every shell is calcium carbonate. So you throw the shell back in the ocean and that decomposes and actually will, I mean, you need like trillions of shells to probably influence it, but it, it is not a lie to say that if there's no, it's a net positive environment on both the front end and the back end. And as I'm learning more about the, the research side, they can actually help stop algae blooms, which are becoming a big issue. All the nitrates coming off of the, the land because the oysters will filter and grab a lot of that before it becomes a bloom. So there's this, it's a really neat concept. I don't think it's just starting to get going on and understanding that you could have a huge oyster reef and, I actually part of this basin oyster restoration project and we just got a grant from the Nature Conservancy to continue our work in the basin doing shellfish restoration with, with baits, with Nanomet, ourselves, town of Pittsburgh, and the, I think the concepts to try to figure ways to really work with all these different enterprises from lobstermen to oystermen to municipality, just to kind of work together around it. I mean, we're obviously, this has been going on for a long time, but everyone in the oyster is very fresh and very excited to be a part of it by and large. So. John, we had a question from the audience about um, what is involved in making sure the oysters are safe to eat. And before we, before you answer that, we also had a comment, if we could have the speakers repeat the question from the audience here, oh, okay. so yeah. that the audience there can hear it more clearly, that would be great. So um, yeah, so the question is about what makes them safe to eat. So what makes an oyster safe to eat? So essentially they, they are filtering water. So they're taking in what's in the water. So they're taking the runoff. And so the state of Maine monitors everything. They test at different areas and they, there's two types of closures. 
So there's basically a rainfall closure. So if there's more than, I believe it's an inch of rain, they will just shut down a whole area because of the runoff and um, from different things that are coming into the water. Generally, I think more from like sewage overflow and stuff off of the land. And then they'll test it when it's tested, pot tested okay. I'm not specifically sure what specific thing they look for E. coli for sure, but also Vibrio is something that different things that they're testing for. And then there's toxic algae blooms that come and they're testing for that. And so they do a really good job and they, every shellfish is different. I'm not a scientist, but the oysters filter pretty quickly through. So it, you can definitely get sick off them and paralytic shellfish poisoning is always the one we've been educated on. It's, it's very, I think, I don't want to jinx it, not no wood, challenging to really get that from the oyster, but I know the scallop, you have to be very careful, different parts of it. And they're all, they're all living animal. The, the shellfish is a unique food when you eat them raw because you're physically eating an alive animal the minute it's been shucked. So they, they live a long time and that can keep them fresh a long time, but it's just temperature control. And every time, the minute they're out of the water that there's bacteria and if they're kept at 33 degrees a month later, you probably would be very safe in that oyster. If that oyster sits in the hot sun at 90 degrees for even an hour Two days later, that's probably in worse shape than the one that's been at 33 degrees for a month. But it is, there's just, it's hard because there's a lot of variables and there's a lot of oysters, but by and large, it's a temperature control. Is a, and, and then these algae, these toxic blooms are really dangerous too. And, and what about red tide? Does that impact you? So that's like the toxic blooms, I believe. Right? Blooms. Red tide encompasses a lot of different things, but there's different algae blooms that, I, I, that will affect them. And, but the oyster, I've been told, and I've been, is very smart. So they know, they sense the algae, the red tide. So they will actually shut themselves down because they're bad for them, too. They can die from these certain species as well. Um, but uh, it's basically the DMR that tests for these things and then lets us know, which can be very frustrating, too, as a shellfish grower because they, they have to pick and choose their boundary lines. It's, very, it's not arbitrary, but if you're in a boundary, like... That could say, so they say they close from Pittsburgh to Portland, and you're probably fine where you are, but you're in that boundary. You are beholden to the whole entire area until like it, it didn't really happen much this year, but a couple of years ago, they shut down the whole area and New Meadows farmers couldn't, um, couldn't harvest for about a month or so because of, because of that. So I just want to, if you don't mind, before I get to your question really quick, because we're only, we've only done spring and summer, we still have fall and winter, and we haven't even talked about all of the species that exist in the summertime. So there's three that I want to touch on. One that you probably see that I mentioned and that Tom mentioned, which is the pobies. And you probably saw quite a bit of these boats over the summer, um, often working together. And this is one space actually where guys um, might not necessarily be as uh, at a territorial or have the same kind of etiquette because hoagie fish, um, they move around in schools. I don't know, perhaps you were standing on the ledges, gazing out on the water and you saw a little silver flips, or maybe you heard like a big whoosh sound. Um, so that's the menhaden that a lot of lobstermen use for bait, but it's also um, in the past few years been a very important sort of income supplement um, secondary fishery for a lot of fishermen. So my husband is one of those guys that Tom was talking about that goes Monday, Tuesday, doesn't fish on Wednesday, goes Thursday, Friday. But this past year, his schedule was sort of interrupted and it went lobster fishing, pokey fishing, lobster fishing, pokey fishing, lobster fishing, pokey fishing, which didn't give him um, an opportunity to do another type of fishery, which we usually do in the summertime, which is bluefin tuna fishing. So you don't necessarily get to see that um, as close to shore as you do with lobstering and, and menhaden fishing. You'll just see the boats kind of on their way out. Um, although uh, bluefin tuna have been found a little closer to shore than they have in the past. Um, it's a very important fishery and it's a very exciting fishery that's made a, a big rebound um, in the past decade. And um, they're caught mostly in the summertime. The season starts June 1. It's uh, a very highly regulated species. Um, very often they can only catch and land one a day. Sometimes it gets up to two and three, but then it'll come back down to one. Bailey Island is home to the longest running bluefin tuna fishing tournament in the 
country almost. The first one was in Nova Scotia in 1937. Ours, the Casco Bay Tuna Clubs, Bailey Island Fishing Tournament started in 1938, still running. I'm actually the board president. Um, we've had to cancel the past couple of years, of course, because of the pandemic, but we'll be back next year. There's a large junior tournament. Um, I'm not exactly sure where it'll be next year, but if you're interested in ever catching you know, to see one of these big, huge fish. Um, they're absolutely beautiful. Um, that's the last full week of July. And then, of course, there is um, ground fish fishing happening um, in the summertime. So, again, ground fish is your species like cod, hake, different types of flounders. Again, you're not going to necessarily see those boats as close to shore. They're offshore. A lot of the boats that we have in Maine, they're only gone for one, two, or three days. They don't go out for as long. There's um, really two places in Maine where ground fish is landed. One is in Port Clyde. Um, perhaps you've heard of like Port Clyde's fresh catch. Sometimes they have some fish up there. But the biggest one, of course, is the Portland Fish Exchange on Commercial Street in Portland. It's an auction house that was founded in the 70s. Um, it still exists today. They don't do the auction like they used to with the paddles. If you go into the Portland Fish Exchange, which you are absolutely allowed to do, you can still see the paddles on the wall. But now it's, it's not as fun. It's all done um, by a computer like everything is. Um, but there's um, quite a bit of fish there. Um, the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, we've been super excited through the pandemic. We have a program called um, Fishermen Feeding Mainers where, um, again, it started during the pandemic as a means to help uh, the ground fish fishermen continue to, to catch ground fish and get paid for it. We set it up um, to be able to, to buy fish from the fishermen, work with the processors, and get it into uh, food pantries, soup kitchen. Is that what it's called, soup kitchen? Yeah. And um, schools. And so that's been very exciting. And our organization is working really hard um, to continue to work with ground fish fishermen to tell more people that this amazing type of fish is available in Maine um, and year round. So, are the tuna caught on single lines? Yes, most right. often, hook and line, rod and reel. Yeah. Yep. Ground fish, tuna, or menhaden. We can talk about more of it as we go into what season's next? Fall? Is that where we're at? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Give so, uh, <laughs> fall is a, a period of routine for me. Um, the lobster fishery, all my traps are out. Um, there's a whole another round of shedder lobsters that come in October, and it's a it's a there's not much else going on for me except for lobster fishing in the fall i just haul because i and there's kind of a panic to it because you you know that it's going to end so you're trying to collect as many lobsters as you can per week and it's just it's a go 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 time it's there are some missed days in the fall because of wind and especially for i have a 33 foot boat so i my traps that are out in the open sea, I miss some days because of wind. And that will result in a day of working in my workshop on rope for next year or getting buoys made for next year or fixing things that broke. There's a never ending list of that. But fall is just a maintenance time of, I mean, uh, maintaining your fishing schedule and going as often as you can for me. Did you know October is National Seafood Month? I did not know that. Oh, it is. <laughs> Happy National Seafood Month. I did not know that. <laughs> it is. And fall such an abundant time of year for seafood. So it's mm -hmm. probably why they, yeah. <laughs> what do you do in the fall? Yeah, so I would I would say, it's like Tom said, it's, it's you're kind of zoning. If you really got your, done well, that they really grow and they're, this is when they're actually the, the, the oysters, because it may, it's a little different as you go up and down the coast of uh, America on the East Coast, but in Maine, because it's so cold, and one of the reasons why the Maine oyster does really does taste really good in New England oysters in general is because they have to produce a lot of glycogens and glucoses and complex carbohydrates essentially to survive the long winter. So they're sweeter. So this is a time of year 
October, November, September, where they're just like stockpiling as much, they're like kind of go as quickly as they can because they're essentially going to then seal up like a bear and hibernate for the, for the winter. So that's really some of the best taste. They taste good all the time, but they are really plumper that time of year. So you're kind of still doing that harvesting, bag switching, but then you're kind of then, so the front end of the fall would be the similar concepts as you did in the summer, but then the back end of the fall is really reversing everything we did in the spring to pull it pull it up or bring it all back down. And that's essentially sinking, they would call it sinking the cages, sinking the, um, the gear. So you're kind of doing that before the winter. You don't have to sink anything, but in the new meadows, you, you kind of have to because of the ice. If there wasn't any ice, they just, they're going to hang out at the bottom of the ocean. They could hang out. Like me personally, on my year, this with my farm this year, it's always such a cluster freak to pull stuff up in the spring. I'm going to probably experiment with just leaving some of the cages is up through the winter, as long as they're not exposed, the actual oyster to the the um, cold temperature, the actual wind, and they're in the water, they're they're fine. But it's just more you sink them because of you just storms and ice and things like that. But they're just chilling. So the winter, this fall is kind of over both both concepts essentially, but just going too because it is they're growing. They're crazy. So Tom, I have a question for you before we move into fall quickly. How have the seasons changed for you from like since when you were younger? Oh, um, how, how much younger? No, I mean, uh, one of the big issues with changes in how I fish seasonally was two. One is because I'm older and I can't do it like I did when I was 30. So the seasonal slowdown for me at age 60 is good. But one of the big changes is re regulations have caused a diminished opportunity to go really hard year round. I mean, 30 years ago, I could go lobster and you could go lobster in July, August, September, October. Take up your traps, go shrimp dragging, do that for a while, then go ground fishing or go mussel dragging. Do whatever you wanted. You could do whatever you wanted. And now there's not a lot of opportunities like they, they, I mean the the just the magnitude of the fishing industry in Maine has shrunk, believe it or not. I, I consider lobster to be a kind of a scary single source. 500 pound gorilla because for example in the mid 1980s when i was fishing out of rockland on the o'hara fleet there was 55 ground fish vessels that were larger than 90 feet in rockland Jeez. yeah wow. and now there are zero so that's that so the seasonal opportunities that you could jump in and out of just out of interest like you know i'm going to try shrimp in this winter yeah i'm going to do that and you just go buy all the stuff you need and go do it. That does not exist anymore. So the seasonal, the seasonal cycle, depending on which aspect of lobster or ground fishing or scalloping, whatever you do, the seasonal cycle has been diminished because of regulations and closures of fisheries that used to exist. So, so is that, I mean, I, I get the re regulation of it, but is it because there's not many fish left? I mean, is, uh, I, I, I know that's a huge debate that we go into, but, but I mean, like the shrimp. I mean, just okay, the shrimp, so right? the question was, um, yeah. is, is given the fact that regulation has dim diminished the seasonal opportunities, yeah. is that a result, is the regulation a result of diminished fish populations yeah. and stocks? Um, I don't know, because I catch a lot of codfish in my lobster traps that are released unharmed. There's a lot of codfish in the Gulf of Maine. Really? Yeah. I, I caught one, you know, where Mitchell Field is right here off Harpswell. I caught a 10 pound codfish two days ago, right there in a lobster trap. Yeah, so yeah, I did. Yeah. There, you can't keep you can't keep codfish that are in lobster traps. So they're released alive. And and around now, and last week I caught some. The shrimp just spill out of lobster traps. There's a lot of shrimp in the Gulf of Maine still. Really? So, but I'm not a scientist and I don't know 
I don't know if the closure is justified by science or not. I'm skeptical enough of science, fish science, marine fish science, that I'm not sure is my answer mm -hmm. to your question. I don't know. The one thing I'll, I'll say about your question is that the terminology overfishing and overfished can sometimes be a little bit misleading yeah. because uh, when we call a species overfished, it doesn't just mean that fishermen were fishing on it. There's so many different impacts to the environment that are changing the ocean that by saying that the species is diminished because of fishermen, removes the responsibility from all of us and everything that we're doing to the ocean that also dramatically changes the stocks and where the species are. Like you were saying with the nitrates. Yeah, and I would just second both those things. I've been reading so many science abstracts lately. And it's just, it's, it's kind of very eye-opening to see that there's been very, and not having a lot of data points in the past, but there's been kind of things that people said that, okay, that's the way it is. And it seems even most scientists now are saying, holy frick, there's like a lot of things we do not understand. And it is like very, very complex. And it's just, we just need more research. We need more and we need more and we need more. And there's just, the ocean is, it's just like, you read these things about, they do these studies and they go across the ocean. It's like kind of going across America once every five years and expecting to know everything in America, but, that, but that's all we have. So it's really hard. I'm like, that's, slight generalization on certain aspects of it, but it is challenging because there isn't one answer and it's changed the anthropogenetic genetic, as they call all this input of humans is really, really, and the scales are so long too. This, some of this stuff takes literally thousands of years of cycles in the ocean. And we're all in the last 50 years to hundred years, assuming this is, it's just, it is challenging it is. <laughs> on very many fronts. And it's like, absolutely, um, yeah. Um, so what are we in winter? <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned shrimp, shrimp RIP. I think we all miss uh, main yeah. shrimp. And then the other thing that's available, especially in the winter time, that's my favorite, is scallops. That's winter time is the best time to get scallops. And um, I, unfortunately, I can't speak as um, so much about the scallop fishery. I actually wish I had my friend Tope Braun, who I believe oh, yeah. you know. She is the scallop expert in the state of Maine. She would have been great to have for this. Um, but I will tell you this about scallops. They freeze incredibly well and they're delicious in the summertime. So the best thing that you can do in the wintertime is when you see scallops being sold, buy a gallon, freeze them in pounds, and then enjoy them year round. And I would actually say that about 99% of Maine seafood, oysters and things um, that's not included in that, um, freeze incredibly well. So you can always enjoy things year round. Um, shrimp, scallops, and then now we're back to the fall, right? Did we cover the fall? We did. We did cover the fall. So yeah. have we gone winter. through all the season? No, we didn't. We're we still in winter. winter. Sorry, guys. Which <laughs> <laughs> is cold, <laughs> cold and dark. It's cold and dark, and we all get a better. Good night. <laughs> so what are you doing in the so winter? winter? Winter for me, um, I begin taking my traps out of the water in December, in the late November, December. By Christmas, if I don't fish through the winter, some years I do fish through the winter. The reason why I normally don't is because where I, my wharf lookout point, it often freezes and it's a giant nuisance if it freezes and your boat's still there. <laughs> Walking out to your boat on the ice. <laughs> I've done it many times. And so I take my boat, and then I take my boat out of the water and winterize it and take a break. I usually take a break and then immediately start working on gear and boat for getting it in the water in March. So it's kind of a, <clears throat> and I do some side jobs in the winter um, as I see fit and would interest me. And uh, so it's kind of a quiet, it's kind of a peaceful, quiet time for me because I'm just kind of going through row, painting buoys working on my boat and lots of little projects of my winter. Yeah. I will say too, the one thing for fishermen in the wintertime is a lot of organizations and things that are happening try to pack meetings into the wintertime that require fishermen's attention. So, you know, even with our own, own oh, excuse me, own organization, we're like, ah, it's summertime, leave the fishermen alone. And then it's like, it's wintertime, 
Now is when we can maybe catch them, although most of them are busy year round, as Tom said, catching something or working on something that pertains to their business. But March is also the, the main, main fisherman's forum that happens at the Samoset in Rockland. It's like a trade show and seminar um, for fishermen where topics um, that are important to different fisheries um, are spoken about. Um, so what are you doing? So, so I think similar, the, the winter is a little more like calmer time and the majority of, you're not really farming, you can't really farm in the winter because they're not growing and it's, it's cold, but you do still harvest. I mean, there's still demand and demand does diminish, but that that's changing too is real time is more, more people want horses throughout the country. So the majority, your farm is sunk, but a lot of farms will keep like, they'll like prepared some market oysters somewhere that's a little more easily accessible on their farm. So you maybe go out once a week to grab oysters just to grab them and get back to shore to, 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 to sell to someone. Um, but essentially it's the same. You're kind of tinkering and just taking a little breather, but there's always something to be done on every front. And that's the oyster. I think the, the real powerful thing of the whole aquaculture farming world is the scallop and the seaweed and all our eggs are in kind of like things like six, I just heard today, 76% of our fishery is lobster and it kind of went from ground fish to lobster. And it would be just be great to continue to keep our coastline, the aquaculture can be a really good, has the potential to be a really strong hedge on the one basket. And it's, we have potential to make like the Rolls Royce quality products with the Gulf of Maine's nutrients and the temperatures here. So it's a slow burn into it and it, it is slowly happening, but it's exciting to see what, it's got to create more demand for seaweed because not a lot of people eat it in Maine, in, in the world, in America, or they do in other parts. And the scallop, we're not phenomenally good at doing it like other countries are yet because the scallops move through the water. And so you got to figure a way to kind of, with the oysters, just like hanging out in a bag once you, you got it. So they're just more challenging. Yeah, I think they for, take for granted people just know how to do these things. Like we don't. <laughs> and like there's a lot of people doing it for hundreds of years in other parts of the world. So it's, I think, learning how these other areas do it to bring these techniques to, to Maine and slowly getting more and more people who have, because there's so many great boating skills on the coast of Maine with all the other fisheries and you need boating skills to do the aquaculture too. So it's, it's, an, it's exciting to see the slow transition in some ways into that. And there, it's a good hedge to see what it's call up on the lobster because you do it in different seasons if you're not doing the offshore stuff too. But the oyster essentially are chilling. So I'll say my winter is not always my favorite time of year. My husband, so we have 1,200 federal permits, I believe, lobstermen that go fishing offshore in the winter time. And it's not my favorite because he spends the night. And so sometimes depending on where he's spending the night, I don't get a chance to talk with him. Um, we, But I mean, that's okay. He's He comes home and he's cold and, you know, <laughs> He doesn't go out as often as he does in the summertime. Um, you know, it's it's becoming harder and harder. And we, we didn't talk about this and maybe people will have questions, but weather forecasting is not what it used to be. And, you know, even after you look at three apps and talk to two other fishermen, sometimes when you get out of the cove, the wind changes. Um, if you are chasing lobsters and they're further offshore, instead of going 10, 15, 20 miles, you have to go 25, 30 miles. And, and this goes for ground fish as well. You know, if you're, you're chasing species around um, and you have to go to different places that you haven't been before, um, because so many fishermen are incredibly concerned about their future of their business. Um, sometimes they might also be taking risks that aren't um, what we think, you know, aren't necessary, but they feel are necessary. Um, and that happens in not great weather in the winter time sometimes. Um, so I think it's important when we're talking about fisheries through the seasons to keep in mind, you know, some of the social aspects of these things as well. And um, things like the weather and things that we take um, sort of for, for granted with these things um, that fishermen are trying to make it work with all of these regulations that Tom is, is talking about. And it's um, incredibly tough. And that would go for clam harvesters as well. So um, I was talking to clam harvester about this and I'm like, they'll continue clamming through the winter time if they're able, if the flats aren't frozen over. Um, and that's because they want to, because it's food and because, you know, it's, it's their jobs. Um, it does become harder for them in the wintertime as well, though, because 
if flats are frozen, if they're closed, um, the areas where they can harvest clams become smaller and smaller. And I'll add, and I don't mean to get too contentious, but also as more private property signs start to pop up um, along the coast of Maine, that also makes it uh, incredibly difficult for them to be able to get to work, to be able to, to harvest clams. Um, you know, so the, the, the obstacles, as much as the challenges in the work, the obstacles uh, for fishermen also change through the yeah, season. But, but doesn't Maine law allow you to go into the intertidal zone to harvest clams and stuff? It's the accessing the intertidal zone that gets to be the top part sometimes. It's getting to it. It's getting to it. Yep. Yeah. And, and that includes even parking to get to the intertidal oh, zone. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you mentioned that the fishermen are concerned about the future of the industry. Um, is it, it seems to me there's more people than there's ever been, you know, and uh, and I understand, you know, global warming is changing the oceans. Um, but I mean, is it is it over-regulation? Is it like, what is the concern? What is the concern? What's the major onus of that concern putting all this pressure on you? On the, on the industry? On that, why are these fishermen, you know, so worried about the future of the industry when it seems to me that demand should be higher than ever before? And demand for seafood is higher than ever right. before, especially through the pandemic. So the USDA that regulates agriculture also advocates for farmers. The regulating body that regulates for fishermen the fisheries themselves does not advocate for fishermen. No. So there's actually quite a few social issues that are kind of at play. There's also some major current events that are occurring where fishermen don't necessarily feel like their voices are being heard when they're asked to sit at the table. Those two topics are offshore wind development and right whale entanglements, hypothetical right whale entanglements. <laughs> and those two things combined have the potential to take up so much space on the ocean and impact the ecosystems in a way that's deeply concerning to fishermen. And it's those things coupled with coastal conflict, as well as managing small businesses in 2020 that have fishermen incredibly concerned about the future of their businesses. How about the water temperature? Because we keep hearing that the Bay of Maine is increasing the temperature faster than any other place on the globe. Is that affecting? Yeah, I mean, yeah, water temperature definitely does affect. Um, so interestingly enough, I've, I've heard that there's there's two sides to that story. And unfortunately, I don't have enough of the knowledge to be able to, to dive into it a lot more. But yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. Environmental impacts are also concerning. Like I mentioned, bad weather patterns, more severe storms, these types of things are also so it's the, it's the cumulative impact of all of these things that when you really sit down and think about it, which I do, causes a great amount of stress and anxiety for fishermen. Tony, can we get back to the whale? There's another question about whales, and this is really maybe more for Tom. Um, can you talk about how this would affect lobstering and the gear? Just whales in general or...? The, the regulations, the proposed regulations. I mean, <clears throat> I've never seen a right whale. Okay? And this year, the regulations have already affected fishermen for about a decade. Because about 10 years ago, we had to change our rope from sinking ground line to floating ground line. I mean, floating ground line to sinking ground line. So I'll explain that. Most, most lobster fishermen put a buoy down to the trap and that's tied to another trap and another trap and another trap. And, another, and that number of traps varies based on vessel size usually and where you're fishing. And then another buoy on the other end. Okay. About 10 years ago, the rope that was tied between each trap was often called floating room, and it would make a profile in the water that looked like this. And then that was very important rope to use because in the hard bottom of the Gulf of Maine, that rope 
stays off the seafloor and doesn't get entangled in the seafloor and traps get lost. Lots of traps get lost if that profile doesn't happen. And so regulation went into effect because we believe that right whales would get entangled in that rope profile. Every lobster harvester in the state of Maine had to eliminate all the float rope and go to sink rope, which then got caught on the seafloor and abraded quickly and had to be replaced or you lost traps. And I think that cost me $11,000. That was an unfunded mandate time and, you know, and then multiply that times 5,000 lobster catchers. Then this year, um, we had to mark our and our buoy lines with purple markers, purple rope. And that cost me about $1,500 and 50 hours of time to do it, times the whole coast. So that the regulations have already affected us and it hasn't even touched the areas yet. And then, and then there's areas that are closed to fishing now and lobster, catchers in those areas had to stop fishing in that area until it's open again. So, and there's a fear, I have it, is that what, what, will, it, will it potentially close the entire fishery? If it, it has happened in the West Coast. Over the next 10 years, lobstermen have to reduce their gear their, in their end lines by 90%. So almost 100%. <clears throat> what? Of buoy lines. Buoy have to be lines have to be eliminated from the water. From the water. They're testing. Which is... And also, it's not that just lobstermen don't see right whales in the Gulf of Maine. There's not been a right whale sighting in the Gulf of Maine in 13 years, quite a long time. The science does not support the, the new regulations. So if you don't have the buoys, um, how will you find your trash? <laughs> is it all the GPS? <laughs> that's that's the question, that's the question of the... <laughs> I, I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only one asking this. No, <laughs> no, you're not. And what I, what I would actually say is this is a, a pretty complex and, and nuanced. If it's something that enough people might be interested in talking about, too, we could also um, ask, like, the Maine Lobster Men's Association, or we could do it and talk about it if there was interest. But it's um, it's, it's pretty worrisome because the, the number one cause of death for a lot of whales is ship strikes, but... Dealing with the shipping industry is incredibly difficult, as you would imagine. Taking on Maine's lobster industry is a little bit easier. Isn't it? Did I hear it's in court now? It's in court. Yeah. So there's lawsuits happening in multiple different directions. Yeah. But the, the lobster, Maine lobstermen are working very hard to defend the future of their industry. So they, kids like my daughter, Jocelyn, who even though she has a little 21-foot privateer and two traps, and you can see the water also has to have purple markings on her gear in case of right whale. So the purple marking, that this, what is that? That's supposed to let the whale It identifies. So no, if the right whale gets entangled. Oh, no, no, that, that Maine has purple and Asher has another color. So oh, it's, it's, a, it's a, if, if we tangle one up, they we'll can never get it. Yeah, they can But it even, up, you know, you go over to Lookout Point, you look out and you see all those buoys, every single one of the ten lines tied to those buoys has purple markings on it in six feet of water. It's the craziest that thing. Is yeah. not but that's, that's, yeah. Well, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying a little more about what you've seen in terms of environmental changes. Yeah, you know, I, is I'd it like changing the beginning that. of the season or the starts? Or I mean, I... I can put it over time too, and then yeah, in, in like the last five years or so. But um, when I was a kid, we we would lobster fish off the coast of New Jersey. We fish two and three miles out. It's all sand bottom. There's a lot of wrecks and rock piles, and we would catch a lot of lobsters right close to shore. And now, by the time I was in high school, the first traps were forty miles out, and and then by the time I was in my early 20s, we were fishing in an area called Hudson Canyon, which is 100 miles off Atlantic City. And that's lobsters. still a good fishery in New Jersey. Yeah, but it's an offshore fishery, 100 foot steel vessels with 2,000 traps, um, six man crew. 
I mean, if you look at the main lobster industry, and you know, it's a good, it's a robust industry, but we keep catching around a hundred million pounds of lobsters per year. But if you look at the vessels that do it now compared to 20 years ago and where they're going to do that, it is not the same fishery. It's changed dramatically. There's vessels now, they're million dollar lobster boats up and down the coast and they're going 40, 50 miles. That down in Korea, they catch a lot of lobsters and every one of those boats is way out. So um, environmentally, and, and I've seen in the last 10 years, now 10 years, like John was saying, you, it's, a, you, it's statistically insignificant over a science timeline, but when I've seen this change as a kid and then now, um, even 10 years ago in these bays, that I didn't have to go, I didn't have to go anywhere with these bays. And now the better fishing that I experience is out in the open sea. There's no question about it. So there's that with lobsters. And then environmentally, other things are um, fish species that weren't really too abundant not many years ago are starting to show up more and more like black sea bass are pretty common in main waters now. Traditionally, those are a mid-Atlantic species, Cape Cod South. And um, this year, and I don't know if it was a storm or not, but we caught um, Spanish mackerel in Casco Bay, which are Florida species. I caught a, a fish, a little fish that normally doesn't come north of the Carolinas in, in the bay. And there, there's, so there's a lot of that weird, those changes. My sister owns a big tackle shop on Long Beach Island, New Jersey, and they're catching mahi mahi surf fishing in New Jersey this summer. So environmentally, I, I think there's definitely change, but I'm a layman. I, I'm just I'm just seeing a lot of the subtleties of it. But I, I feel it. I see it and I feel it. The clam harbor surf too, and I'm sure you would too, like the guides and the inner tidal see a lot of changes too, also with like invasive species and different things. Like milky ribbon worms were a problem. And then of course the green crabs and stuff too coming up and showing up in abundance. How they're accessing the inner tidal sea level rise, all of these things yeah. are and in Harpsville, it's important for us, obviously, to keep in mind because 216 miles of coastline. Very exciting. Are, are, you, are you concerned that the lobsters are going to move north? Well, I mean, see, I don't, I don't understand it enough to be concerned yeah. because, like last year, I didn't, we didn't, or two years ago, we really didn't catch a lot of lobsters up in here. Mm -hmm. And a place that had been doing very poor for 20 years had some of the best fishing they had in 20 years, and that was around Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Oh. The New Hampshire coastline, mm -hmm. they did exceptionally well. And, but we didn't do very well. So you would think that intuitively, the further east you go, the better you're going to do. And I don't know. I, and in Nova Scotia, they absolutely cream lobsters. They just, yeah. they just catch a lot. And they have a different fishery, different bottom type, but... Um, I mean, if that if I knew that were true, I'd be concerned just for myself. But that's just nature. So it's seven thirty, which is our end time, and I want to thank you guys so much in the room and on the webinar. If there were questions that we did not get to that you have, please feel free to mail me. Uh, you can go to maincoastfishermen.org. If you have Julia's contact, she can always forward me emails. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. If you, uh, on your chair, I put um, a report. Um, 2019, uh, I did some research in 10 fishing communities, specifically about the working waterfront and various um, concerns that were happening. And so it's, it's like all reports, you know, the moment it's printed, it's outdated. Um, this one actually isn't that outdated. Um, the only thing I would say is maybe a couple of things have gotten worse. But um, it's 
um, feel free to take it. Um, you can find my contact information uh, via that as well. But one of the things that's um, really important to us is just being able to communicate with people about the fishing industry because we recognize that it's, you know, sometimes kind of complex and nuanced and you see boats in front and you're like, that doesn't look like a lobster boat. That doesn't look like, so please feel free to send your questions to Maine Coast Fishermen's Association and we'll find the right guys to talk, to ask if we don't know or we'll find you the information. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much. For thank you. Really, super appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And we're doing more, so keep an eye. All right, I think.